So is it safe to say you feel most comfortable here? Yeah. So, well, I mean, that answers my next question. I was going to say, <laughs> how displaced is the comfort you feel here to the comfort you may feel in Brazil? Oh, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a different type of love. Mm. So obviously in Brazil, I have a lot of nostalgia mm -hmm. from when I was a, a child and I still have all my friends over there. We'd, we haven't stopped communicating. Thank you to WhatsApp and social media. Yeah. We was able to keep contact with each other. And of course, my family is there. There's always going to be love for my family in Brazil. Um, my mom's always speaking to my grandmother. We always, uh, maybe I'm going to the kitchen. Yeah. And then they're on face. And I was like, oh, hey, gran, love you. Yeah. Hey, auntie, love you. Hey, cousin, love you. How are you doing? So there's always going to be love there. And there's always going to be memories there. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not kind of the same. Mm -hmm. And going back to what your identity, the identity crisis. Yeah. When I go to Brazil, they say, oh, it's the English guy. Yeah. But when I'm in the UK, oh, it's the Brazilian guy. Mad, so yeah. where do I fit in the middle? Where, mm -hmm. where, where do I fit? Yeah, and yeah. it's like in, in Brazil, where I'm from, I'm known as the, a British, a Brit. And here I live, where I've grown up most of my life, I'm known as a Brazilian. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, why, well, you know, what am I? <laughs> if Brazil play England. Brazil. Brazil. I know the question is going to be. <laughs> Why is that? Because you know what? I'm the same. If, if say, Jamaica was to play, I I wasn't even born in Jamaica. I like my grandparents are from there. That's it. But if Jamaica play England in any sporting event, I'm supporting Jamaica. <laughs> why, why do we do that? I don't know. I don't know. I think I just, I love the country. I love, I think it's just because I have such a strong connection with Brazil. Mm -hmm. And to deny Brazil in any way, shape or form mm -hmm. would be like, rah, so I'm denying who I am in my core. Yeah, yeah. So any opportunity I get to support Brazil, 100%. Would you say, um, how can I word this? Do you enjoy being known as like the English guy in Brazil and being the Brazilian guy in England? Do you like that idea of being like, having that unique quality? I don't enjoy it in Brazil. Okay. I enjoy it in the UK. W why is it different? Um, I feel like, cause, cause I moved away, you know, I was kind of like pulled out of like this world that I was so used to. I was kind of pulled out from it. Mm -hmm. I feel like now I'm not rejected, but in a sense, like mm -hmm. they reject me. Not like, okay, no, they don't reject me, but it's like, they know that I'm Brazilian. They know that I was that I was born there, but my culture has changed. Yeah. And they identify me with, the, with a Brit. Yeah. When deep inside, no, I'm Brazilian. So, like, I want to be associated as a Brazilian. I see, yeah, yeah. Even then, by my own people saying, it's like, no, you're from the UK now, you're a Brit. Mm. It's like, it's not, it's a little bit heartbreaking, but it's one of the things that you have to, like, deal with. Life moves on. But when people say in the UK, it's like, oh, it's Brazilian. It's like, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, I don't know what it's like exactly where you're from in Brazil. Um, but I wonder if, um, well, is it a multicultural place? Oh, yeah. 100%. The part where you're from. So yeah. it's not just Brazilians around your hometown. Are there like, I don't know, Africans, oh, um, Americans? Yeah, there are. So, okay. I mean... When you say multicultural, I'm thinking there are so many different races in Brazil, but they're all Brazilians. I see, yeah. So, like, you get Japanese Brazilians, which yeah. is crazy. There's so many Japanese Brazilians in Brazil. Um, Asian, uh, like, Indian Brazilians. Uh, yeah. People from whose heritage are from Pakistan. Then you've got Australians. Mm -hmm. And then when sometimes I do see an American and they're speaking English, yeah. I'm like, oh, Hey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't say it, but I think in my head. Yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah. So like, there's it's a very it's very multicultural. But when I do hear someone speaking in English, I'm kind of like taken back a little bit. Mm. And I was like, oh, what are you doing here? Yeah, yeah. But I'm thinking, well, they're probably here doing the same thing I'm doing. Well, I think the reason I asked that is because, like, growing up, say here in Oxford, which is a multicultural place, because so many people are from like different kind of ethnic backgrounds, we kind of create this this new community of people who are different 
And it's kind of weird how we like, for example, I grew up, I hung out a lot with, say, John Gahari, who's Iranian, Sahel and Zahebu, a Pakistani, Oasis, who's Somalian, and none of us are from the same background. Mm. But we formed a group of like outsiders, which became its own community in a, in a respect. And that's why it's kind of, it's sometimes almost comforting to be known as the ethnically different guy because yeah. I'm actually in a big community of ethnically different people. Yeah. And I wonder, the reason why I asked that question is maybe in Brazil, there isn't so much of a community of the ethnically different people, if that makes sense. No, that's not that. That, was, that is foreign over there. Yeah. Like, because everyone is just, it's a very warm, when I say warm, I don't mean like hot temperature, mm. but like, I mean, like, um, the way people are inside, they're very friendly, they're very mm. caring. So, like, regardless of, you know, we have white Brazilians and we have black Brazilians. Mm-hmm. In my hometown, personally, um, racism is so much of an issue as maybe southern Brazil. Okay. So, like, we all combine together and it's like, rah, we're just Brazilian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, like, when, when I came to England, people say, oh, so where are you? Are you black or are you white? I'm Brazilian. Yeah, yeah. And that's when I, when going back to, that's when I first began to understand, mm. okay, so if you're a certain color, you do this. And if you're a certain color, you're recognized as that. Yeah, yeah. But to me, it was like, I'm brown, man. I'm like, I'm like a light tan brown. I'm yeah, from yeah. Brazil. Like, what do you yeah, want me yeah. to say? Um, yeah, so then when I came to England, it's like, I, I try to fit in with like, what I thought was, the typical English person mm-hmm. and so like, that's when I started doing all this stuff with my hair and yeah. whatnot and then that's when I realised that right, a few years down the line I realised I, I gotta stop doing this I just yeah. gotta be me and re- gotta find myself and then that's when I became like kind of becoming friends with people who are the same as me Yeah, and they're from different backgrounds mm-hmm. and it was wonderful Yeah, it yeah. was generally it was such a a breath of fresh air because I can now relate to them. Yeah. I used to speak to, to my, my friend Raymond, and yeah. he said, oh, I'm from Zambia. I was like, where the hell is Zambia? Yeah, yeah. And I said, I was in Africa. And yeah. obviously, I was a bit ignorant back then. Africa. There's countries in Africa. <laughs> yeah. So obviously, I didn't, because being from Brazil, I, people could say to me, oh, I'm from, I don't know, Venezuela. Mm-hmm. That's South America. Yeah. Right. And then that's when I began to realize, okay, so no, Africa is not a country. I've been lied to my whole childhood. Africa is a continent, yeah. which I kind of knew, but it was kind of one of those things that was in the back of my head. Yeah, yeah. And then he used to tell me, oh, we used to do this thing, this in Zambia. And I was like, oh, rah, swear down. We used to do this in Brazil as well. Yeah, yeah. And what we're talking about is like kind of like a, a third world country um, kind of uh, similarities that they have. Yeah, yeah. For example, if we, we didn't have technology, we'd go outside, we'd play football, we didn't have a ball, we'll get some newspapers, we'll put it all together, we'll yeah, grab yeah. a couple of bags, we'll tie them around. Yeah. We had a we had a we had a ball. Yeah, yeah. You know? And it was like, rah, I thought we only did this in Brazil. But yeah. nah, it happens everywhere around the world. Would you say you're a it's funny, I'm actually reading this, I'm gonna show it to the camera. I'm reading this book at the moment called Third Culture Kids. Are you familiar with the term? Yeah. Would you say you are a third culture kid? Yes. That's really interesting. It's really, it's, it's particularly interesting because in some respects, I feel we have similarities in terms of our families kind of belong to different cultures. But I guess for you, I, I wouldn't consider myself a third culture kid. I'm third generation, but I definitely acknowledge that I'm more British at oh, home right. and at school and in my community. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. I understand. Would you say your home life growing up was maybe somewhat culturally not different, but had different traditions and stuff than your, say, school life? Um, in fact, now that, now that you've said that, yeah, probably third generation thinking about it because what my mum had to do, she had, because it was just my mum, mm-hmm. my sister that came over and we had to adapt to the culture here in the UK. Yeah, yeah. And so when I speak to my mum, I speak to her in Portuguese. When I speak to my sister, I speak to her in English. Okay, yeah. I don't know why, but it's just just because I was so used to speaking to English with my friends at school. Yeah, yeah. And when my mum's English wasn't so good, I would speak to her in Portuguese. But my sister was on the same wavelength as me. Yeah, of course. We used to speak with her in English. And I think that's kind of affected our culture growing up at home. 
So it was a bit of a divide. Yeah, yeah. And it will go into the whole um, types of. I'm mixing my Portuguese with my English. Yeah. So I'm saying one word in, in English, the other words I'm mixing up in Portuguese. I see. Yeah. Not even to be funny or anything. It was just it was just happening randomly. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like how um maybe someone from India will say something, they're speaking English, speaking English. Yeah, yeah. Next thing you know, it switches and you're yeah, like, Yeah, yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, I just I'm there thinking, I understood two words of that, but yeah, that definitely yeah. wasn't fully my language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like that and also because because we were so new to the UK, um, we didn't have many Brazilian friends, mm -hmm. so we had to do everything the British way. Yeah. And we had to eat what the British ate because we didn't know where to get the supplies to make our own food. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, had, we didn't know where to get this type of meat from because we didn't know the markets. Yeah, yeah. So it was like, rah, just go to Tesco's, get some chicken, get some beef. Yeah. We can make rice, cool rice and chicken, yeah, rice yeah. and beef. That was it. But then it was like, okay, cool. Got fish and chips. We'll have that. We'll have kidney pie. Kidney pies? Kidney steak pies. Yeah. Steak Shepherd's kidney pie. pie. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> it. We'll have that. And then slowly it became, this will become a, not an everyday thing, but a regular occurrence. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of affected on my culture at home. Because mm -hmm. I was being, um, I was being processed into a, a British culture. Yeah, yeah. That I wasn't used to when I first came, came yeah, to yeah. the UK. That's really interesting. I want to um, fast forward because we started talking about your kind of university experience. Um, and one of the main reasons why I wanted to talk to you on the podcast is because I think you're very talented and I think I'm quite excited by all the things that you've got coming Thank up. You. And so I want to hear how that was kind of shaped and harnessed your kind of media skill and talent and also if you could kind of filter into that what uh how much your identity encouraged and shaped your ability and skills okay makes sense um so i think I, obviously i picked it up very from a very young age my stepdad was a a camera operator of channel four mm -hmm. so it was always like my media background was always there. I was constantly watching him edit stuff. Yeah. And I was just like, look over his shoulder, be like, oh, what's that? Oh, what's that? What's yeah, this? Yeah. What's that? What's this? What's that? And it was the house was filled with equipment that I had no idea what it was at the time. It was just junk to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then when I went to uni, I realized I wanted to be a, I want to do some form of media. Yeah. From sixth form, from doing media studies, film studies. Mm -hmm. And when I got to university, at first, I wanted to do a, I wanted to be a trailer editor, an editor, essentially. Okay, yeah. So I began doing that, and I realized, actually, I quite really enjoy being behind a camera yeah. and doing my own work. And then I began making, like, uh, interviews, yeah. documentaries, editing all myself, and I began to learn the tricks of the trade a little bit more. This is exactly what I'm trying to do right now. Yeah, I began to learn, learn like, so much, like, yeah. all the editing, I learned different software, mm -hmm. I learned how to use Photoshop, Adobe After Effects, Final Cut Pro, mm -hmm. um, all the other Adobe uh, Cloud stuff, Creative Cloud. Yeah. So I learned how to use all of that, and I was thinking, uh, as much as I love being behind a computer and editing, I want to be out there in the front lines, yeah. like either holding a camera yeah. or directing. And that's what really like became, okay, I want to be a director. Wow. Like that's how I want to be a filmmaker, but specifically I want to be a director. I want to be able to direct people on how I want them to uh, produce my vision. Yeah. So I've got something in my head. Okay, cool. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And seeing it all come alive or in the edit room is one of the best things that yeah, yeah. I get to witness. And that was all, I'm guessing, throughout your university experience, you're kind of acknowledging your love for, say, cinematography yeah. and directing and stuff like that. Definitely. This was all during your time in Leeds. And then following that, am I right in thinking, did you go straight on to a master's or? No, a no, no. So um, I went traveling. I went, as everyone does. Well, not everyone. But I wish I did. I just did a little Europe I just, tour. That was it. <laughs> To be honest, I was offered a job at Sky Sports, um, but they wanted me to commit to a five-year contract. And wow. I was, I thought that once I do this, that's it, I'm not gonna, I'm stuck in that kind of role forever. Yeah. As being like a sports, 
you know, doing sports coverage. Yeah. Of like, which a lot of my friends that from Leeds are now doing. Yeah. And that's not something I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted my end game was to be in film. Yeah. And so I, I declined on that and I decided to go travel. And I wanted to get a bit more idea of the world and what people go through. Mm -hmm. And I did, I took my camera with me and I got some amazing shots of all the different countries I went to. Wait, hold up, before we get into that, because I think it seems like there's a very clear reason as to why you wanted to travel the world and maybe some of your colleagues didn't want to and were more willing to take the job. Do you think being somewhat a third culture kid factored into the fact that you want to travel a bit more? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, because I'm coming from, mm. so I'm coming from the other side of the world, yeah. essentially, from Brazil to, to the UK. And my mum used to like to travel a lot. Yeah. And I think I kind of picked it up from her. Yeah, yeah. And it was one of those things that was always talked about in my childhood. Mm -hmm. My mum would say, oh, I went to this place, and I went to this place, I went to that place, I went to that place. Yeah. And I kind of fell in love with the idea of just going out and yeah, yeah. traveling. And as soon as I left university, I thought, I don't want to be tied down in a job. That's not my end result, but yeah, not my yeah. end game. And so just I decided to take a break. And then I went off to see the world. Where did you go then? I went to Indonesia. Oh, I started off in Tha Southeast Asia, essentially. So Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. Um, and then I ended back up in Brazil for the last month of my travel. Does Brazil count as traveling for you? No, not really. <laughs> no, I just, I just see family. It's yeah, a holiday. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely just a holiday. And... It might be a quite big question, but what did you learn during this travel experience about yourself and maybe about what you want to do? Um, about what I wanted, well, first of all, about myself is that I learned to be a lot more acceptable mm. and to others and their circumstances. Yeah. And it just opened up my eyes to see how other people are living. Yeah, yeah. Um, one, I think one of the best things I learned out there is when I went to Vietnam. I had this idea in my head mm -hmm. that Vietnam was a war-ridden place, yeah. living in pro poverty, and that it wasn't very nice. Yeah. And to be fair, one of the very first experiences of me jumping into Vietnam was they wouldn't let me in, and I was wearing uh, camouflage trousers. And I, I was see. like, yo, what's going on? Why didn't they let me in? Bearing in mind, I also had a big beard at the time. Yeah. All right. Um, and they wouldn't let me I think I was held up in customs for about an hour. And someone finally came over that knew how to speak English. And I asked them, oh, what's going on? Um, and they said, they don't want to let you into the country. I asked why. They said, oh, they think you might be a potential Al-Qaeda Al terrorist. Wow. And I was, I literally, I laughed for like a split second before I realized, it's yeah, not it's, it's not that funny. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's not funny at all. And I realized, no, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a terrorist. I'm not here. I'm only here to sightsee. And I kind of had to pull out evidence that I wasn't. Yeah. One of the first things I pulled out was like uh, a rosemary, like a cross. It was like, which has no relation to me if I was a terrorist or not. Um, but it's like, I'm, I'm Christian. And I started going through Facebook posts. And it's like, look, wow. I live in Oxford. I'm from this. Yeah. I don't normally have it. So it was like, a, they, they thought I fit into this stereotype. Yeah. Because they're already, um, their history is a lot of war they felt that I fell into a stereotype. Yeah. So I kind of had to like say, no, that's not me. That's mental. Uh, yeah, it was, was kind of mad. And now uh, one well, of the best things I took from that, whilst being in Vietnam, eventually they did let me in, of course. Yeah. And there was a question that I had in my head was, oh, how do uh, the Vietnamese uh, feel towards the Americans? Because there was a lot of bad things that happened over there. And I was, I was visiting the... Uh, the war, the war museums mm -hmm. and the histories. I learned a lot about them. And I felt like I built up a perception of anger towards Americans at that point yeah. for what it did to the Vietnamese. Yeah. And I was on a tour bus and they were taking us to the mines where the Vietnamese would like go through to escape the bombs. And someone asked the tour guide, oh, would you have any resentment towards the Americans? Or what do you feel about um, the people who did this to your country. Yeah. And his response was single-handedly the best thing I had heard my whole trip. And it was, you know, when the best way to forgive hatred is with love. 
And so when when someone does something that's dishonest or out of anger, or out of hatred towards you, the only thing you can do is kind of like turn the other cheek. Yeah. You know what I mean? Wow. And he went into more into depth about it, a little bit more detail, but that was where I can remember for that. It's like, right, you just have to love everyone regardless of where you're from, mm. what culture you have, anything done to you in the past is like live and f- uh, love and forget. Yeah, yeah. Almost in a sense. So that was really nice. I'm guessing you've taken that as like a, a motto for life. Oh, yeah. Somewhat. Yeah, definitely. That's amazing, man. I'm, I'm so envious because... You know, I obviously love to explore culture and identity and stuff like that. I'm even reading a book about third culture kids, but um, I haven't really traveled, man. Oh man, definitely go out there, go see the world. It's one of the best things I say to people is just see how other people are living.